Welcome to tonight's shear. You'd base by Menachem Ov. Actually, uh, my late father's Yem Huledis is born in Tofresh Pei Hay, 1925. So, uh, Right, so we have here some questions and some feedback. So let's go into things Allah said. So first of all, someone asked me to clarify the background for Chabad having large tefillin, the large, particularly Shilrosh. So first thing you have is, well, let's go to on the left of the, of the, of the uh, screen, where you have a toastfus from Erevin. How does filling get into Erevin? Well, there is this discussion in the Gemara. What happens if someone is walking on the street and he sees some tefillin, which are on the way at the roadside, about salvaging the tefillin? And the, the Gemara says, Reiser says, Mokwin yesh beroish, there is space on the person's head a person's head has got space for two tefillin shilrosha. So you could really salvage two tefillin at the same time. There's a discussion whether you have to do that on Shabbos, but fine. I'm not going into the, the detail of the halacha. And that's what we have. This idea that the space um, to have two tefillin on your head. So talks about so try to start talking about different sizes and then he says um says the rear about the ballet toys he found in a medrash that the size for the tefillin is the base at the boys is two finger breadth which means when we measure a finger we mean the thumb and the thickness of the thumb and that's generally assessed at about two centimeters so when you hear people saying about the chabad film arba al arba it really irritates me because it's done to do with four by four that might be good for a nice fancy car but um we, it's four by four centimeters because it was two by two finger breadth yeah so the sheer the sheer this so it says toys first he found in a medrash that the shear of the tefillin is the size of two fingers Two finger breadth and the semech lodor support for this that the tzitz which there's a gold plate which was worn by the coin godel on his forehead so it measures two finger breadths as it says in the gemara sukkah and then it says in the gemara erikin that between the tzitz and the mitznefes which is the turban there's space for the tefillin so the coin godel wears the tzitz and then there's a hair, and then there's a turban. And then the hair, that gap, that was where he wore his tefillin. The Kohen Godel, or for that matter, the Kohenim had Yoitim, did not wear Shalyad tefillin, because that would be an interruption uh, between the sleeve and their body. And it says Al Basoro, yeah, they should be wearing their uniforms on their flesh. So they didn't wear Shalyad, but they did wear Shalrosh. Oh, sorry, the Kohen Godel wore Shalrosh, I remember Shalyad and about the Kohenim had Yoitim. It says there was a space between the he the, the uh, head plate and the and the turban where the filling were visible. So Toysus interestingly says that the, that although we then generally say that the filling are on the forehead, but Toysus learns no actually that sits was worn on the hairline above the hairline, and so there's the, there's the sitsis the sit sorry, and then there's that sits, which is two its boys of hairline. And then there's the tefillin, which is another two its boys of hairline, and then starts the mitznefes. So that's the way Tosus learns. That's a, a basis for the what the Gemara and the Brisa says that the space for two tefillin, one above the other, because it sits, and the uh, and the tefillin behind it would be each two its boys. So that's where he's got this source of the tefillin being two fingers. This is also brought in Shukhan Aruch. So this is in Simin Lamed uh, base. So where we have here that basically there's no set size how big the tefillin have to be. 
um, that the Torah should be at least etzba. Hagoinim omru, hagoinim omru, that the batim of the shalroi should be etzba ayim al etzba ayim. So never mind the titura, which is the base of the tefillin, but the actual boxes of the tefillin should be etzba ayim al etzba ayim. Now, I recall when I was in yeshiva in Brunoir, that's over 40 years ago, there was the son of Reb Nissen, Reb Shalom Be'er of Shalom, and he had somehow a very, very special tefillin, and the titura, which is like the ledge around the tefillin, was, was not more than three millimeters. It was a really very, very thin, difficult to make and difficult to maintain, but that was, he had a very mahuda de pair of tefillin, and so there is this idea that, that this is where the difference between Chabad fill and others is whether the etzba'ayim is measured in the box itself or is the etzba'ayim measured in the, in, in the base. So what we saw already in the first part of this eve, that everyone agrees that the base should be at least, at be, should be at least etzba'ayim, which is about four centimeters. But here the Alter Rebbe adds that actually the Goinim say that the box itself should be etzba'ayim al etzba'ayim. That's where the difference, as I said, that's the difference. Other communities, they keep to having the etzba'ayim, that the basis etzba'ayim is four centimeters. And Chabad, go as the Alter Rebbe says, he habatim shel rosh. The actual boxes should be etzba'ayim. And um, the Primigodim also learns this way, that the measurement of etzba'ayim is actually in the bias itself. This is also, of course, many of us will remember, this is mentioned in Tanya. I think it's going to come up soon in the Shia Tanya, where he talks about mitzvahs having a measurement, the length of the tzitzis, 12 goidlin, 12 finger breadth, and the tefillin, etzba'ayim, al etzba'ayim, umre boys. So he mentioned about the tefillin being a square, uh, sorry, being being it's by him, it's by him. So this is so this is something which we are more particular than which are the communities, and so that's where it comes the large tefillin. And this is a, just a letter of the Rebbe supporting this idea that the measurement of etzbaim is in the boxes, not just in the base. And he refers to the Primagodim who learns this way according to Rashi, etc. Let's go on to the next point. So here we have a shliach somewhere in Europe, and has difficulty to source white eggs and uh, as we all are familiar when you sometimes go on holidays and you buy some brown eggs the incident of having a blood spot is much greater and that's the simple reason because in the candling process the shining of a light so the uh, if it's a white white shell then the candling is more effective and they can see uh, impurities whereas uh, if it's a darker shell, so then the light doesn't penetrate, and so the 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 impurities will will escape the scrutiny of whoever's supervising. All right, so now is there a chiyu to oh, when well, you boil eggs, are you obliged to check those eggs? So let's read the here. This is from Shukhanor Yudaya. Now be careful, don't look at Shukhanor for the laws of eggs. Rather look in the halachas of blood. So there's two separate simonim. Look in the halachas of eggs. You'll talk about which eggs are permitted. Here it's not a question of eggs. It's a question of blood. So he writes here that the Shekhanach writes, Mutalechol beitzim tzluyos afal pi she'enom yecholos libodek. You are allowed to eat roasted, which is boiled eggs, even though it's not, I can't check them. You don't have to check the eggs if there is blood, because you can rely on the majority of eggs which don't have blood. However, if you are making, let's like say, an omelette where you're cracking the eggs and it's during daytime, so then you should check before, before making your omelette in case there's blood in it. So this is the background where we are noyig, that we do check eggs before making an omelette, before making a cake. Um, now what you have here on the on the left of the screen is from the Kafachaim, and is bringing that 
the Arizal was not concerned so much about this chumra, and just if you're making eggs in a, in a frying pan, yes, but otherwise you're not really mechuyah to check boiled eggs. I was brought up that we did. My mother and I did check eggs, but um, that's, shall we say, it's a lefnimi shura sadin. So I hope that answers the question. Let's go on to the next point. Okay, so here's a question. The chazan, uh, there, sorry, there's, there's a, a minion, Baruch Hashem, there's a bris happening that day, and so the moil is there, and the moil had to rush off. So they've said, they didn't say tachnun for the beginning of, you know, right after Shmon Esra, after Chazor Sashat. By the time it comes to Volat Zion, so the, the moil has had to leave. So here's the question: Do do they have to say "I'm not sayach"? And do they have to say "Tfilul uh, David" at uh, before Shir Shalyoim? In other words, does the exemption of Tachnun is it cut off because the moil's gone away, or does it continue till the end of Dav? Now you're not going to find this in Ashkenazi's forum. For the simple reason that the Ashkenazim don't skip Lam Natsir so fast. And as far as Tfil the David before Mashir Shayom, Michal Nusrashkas is not there. It's uh Shir Shayom is said after Aleinu. So it's it you'd have to find it in Sfadish as far as if you're lucky, but you wouldn't find it in Ashkenaz. And, and I looked around, I couldn't find anyone who comments on this. But let's so then let's let's uh, see what we can find. So we have here Taz. And then we have Halochus Ketanois, which is a later Sefer, probably about 300 years ago. And then we've got the Alter Rebbe. I'm not sure which way we're going to, but let's, but let's read the, let's read the Halochus Ketanois. Shaila. Chosn was in the shul when the Shepitzibah were davening. When it came to Tachnun, he's gone. Do we go according to the beginning of davening? They, 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 there was a chosen there, or do we say that he's not here now, so we do have to say tachnum? So this is different to our question. He is talking about that before they even started tachnum, or before the well, before they even started skipping tachnum, he's gone already. We're talk, talking when they did skip, but whether the skipping has to be aborted because the the has gone on his, on his way. In the that sefer halachas ketanos, he refers to the task which we'll read in a moment. Shuvah. So the Psochim Uksovim is a section of the Trumas Hadeshen. And he says in the Trumas Hadeshen, in Simon Pei, he says that they used to have a minic that the Chassanim would leave the Shul in order to enable the people to say Tachnon. So according to this, oh, the Chassan is gone. They say, you don't say, I don't they say, you do say Tachnon. Then the, the writer, the author, asks the question. We have a rule that if you had a minion and then one of the ten left the shul, so you're allowed to finish off. So if, let's say, by Chazor Sashat, you had ten people and then one more person left, so then you could still say Kaddish to Skabul. Because as if this, it's kind of the minion continues even though he's left. So he wants to say, just like you can continue, you can say Kaddish to Skabul, even though the, this man is left, so also you should be able to skip Tachnun because he was there at the beginning. So he comes up with a svara that since at the outset there was the Simcha of the Chosn and the exemption of Tachnun, therefore that should continue even though he's left the room. Fine. That is the the Halochus um, Ketanus. And others, others dispute the the parallel over here, but let's leave that to one side. Let's take a look at the Taz, and then we'll look at the Alter Rebbe. Look at it carefully. So it says in the Shulchan Aruch, I think so that I'm not sure the Shulchan Aruch, the Ramor, v'loy be'beis ha'chos. You don't say Tachnun in the house of a chos. 
ובו זה נראה, ‫דאפילו יוצא אחר כך לבייסוי, ‫even if the chosen has left, ‫אין צורך לא עם התחנונים, ‫you don't have to say תחנון, ‫כגוין והוא רחום. ‫כגיוון שהויה בבייס הכנסת, ‫בשעת התפילה, ‫וכל העולם השמחה. ‫since he was there at the davening, ‫and now even though the chosen has left, ‫you don't have to say תחנון. ‫וכן במילו, if one of the... A celebrants of the bris were there, so then, and they left, you don't have to say tachn. Okay. Those are the words of the Taz. So there's a shul, and there was a chosen there, and the chosen left, or the, or the bal simcha, the bal bris left. Um, wait a minute, yeah. Right. Let's read the altar number. V'af la'achar she'yotso ha'mibes ha'chosen v'ha'ovel v'ovo l'votayim. Even after people have left the base ha'chosen and come home, they do not, do not need to say tach. The fee, and he answers, he says, why? Because the spot for saying Tachnon is right after Shemonesra. Since the, the slot where Tachnon belongs was, over, was over, overruled, so to speak, so this is different, yeah? It's certainly that the Chosen is there, um, it was there at the moment of Tachnon, and then they didn't say Tachnon, because it was there. Then the Chosen, they went, they, the people left the base of Chosen. So yeah, it's, like, it's like difference, yeah? Here, my impression is that he's talking about the Chosen left the house, and here he's talking about when people left the house of the Chosen. All right, meanwhile, the Alter Rebbe says, so the, you, 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 were in, you were in a Chosen's house, in a Chosen's shul, and then you went home, you don't say Tachnon, because at the given slot where Tachnon is said, you didn't say it with reason, with, with your justification, so you don't have to say it later. What about Vuhu Rachum? So he says also, since Vuhu Rachum is said, before Nefila Sapayim, even though there's a chiv to say Vuhu Rachum, according to Minigam Mino, so it's on a level of Minig, and at the moment of the chiv, they were exempted. Which is the moment of Chiyav is right after Tfilas Yud Ches, right after Shmon Esra. Therefore, they have an exemption for the rest of the day. So, on the surface, it looks like that the reason why you why you don't have to say Tachnun when you come home from a shul where there was a Bal Simcha is because at the moment when it was meant to be said, you couldn't say it, and therefore it's 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 lost. Well, then, what about the uh, the other case, where you, the Chosen was, was there, for, or the, the Moyle here in this case, he was there for Tachnun, and so there Tachnun was, was pushed away. But what about Lam Natsayach and, and, and Philo the David? They weren't pushed away because he, he wasn't there. So L'chayra, the reading from the Alter Rebbe, L'chayra, you should, you should be saying it. That, that's, that's the L'chayra, the impression. Um, However, I'm just, I'm just, something was bothering me. The Alter Rebbe says, you left the base hachos. Whereas the Taz seems to be worse, presenting it more that the chosen, the chosen has gone out. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the Alter Rebbe, Dafke worded it, that you left the house of the chosen. Therefore, that's the question whether you should say Tachrun now. But where, if it was that you were in the chosen's house, the chosen was there. And the chosen has left. In other words, you were sure again. If you left that premises, so then the exemption is only because nidchemim came kriyosu. But if you're still in the same premises where the simcha was there, possibly then the simcha remains in that place, and you wouldn't have to pick up later. I'm just reading from the way the Alter Rebbe presents it. Why does he say after they left and went home? Why didn't he present it if the chosen left the premises? So therefore, I'm suggesting if the Chosen left the premises, the Simcha would remain similar to what the Halachas Khtanas is saying. If 
if uh, if an individual leaves the premises, then let's say, all right. So let's in the, to summarize. If someone was there at the Tachanun and didn't say Tachanun because there was a chosan, then he rushed out, not the chosan, and someone else. And now the boss runs out, rushes out, and he's now in the middle of Ashayval and Ashayval Does he say Lam Nasi? And the answer is yes, because there's no reason. It's not Nidchem Im Kaimai Im Kaim Kiviyosai, and nor is he in a place of of uh, Simcha. And therefore, he should be saying it if he leaves uh, the premises. Okay. Um, there is a generally a rule when there's a Suffolk, whether to say Tachnun or not, you take the lenient position, you don't say it. Let's move on. Um, right. Now, someone asks me the question. He's a, a shliach in a campus somewhere in the United States. He listens to the recordings, and so hopefully I'll hear this one too. And he does not have a minion for Friday night. So in certainly the summer, so the question is, does he Macabal Shabbos early? Perhaps he does have some students come for the meal, but they don't have a davening. He's got family, whatever. So he wants to be Macabal Shabbos early, Kabul Shabbos early, and then make Kiddush. And then after the meal, have makes Kiddush, have the meal. And after the meal is over, then to Davin Maid. So is that okay or not? So I told him it is okay. And I'm told that in Manchester, where you've got these extremely late Friday nights, so the Minchas Yitzchak Ravais was Rob in Manchester. And that was what he did. That they were, I guess, not on his own, it was a minion. They would be the Kabul Shabbos. I don't know, 7.30 or something, something like that, do Kabbalah Shabbos, and then they'd go home, make Kiddush, have the meal, and come back for, and come back for the, uh, from, to Davin Maid. So I, I know that there is, it's, 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 it's got a background to it, got backing to it. So he's, he, he wrote this in Yaman, he wrote to me, he sends me a, a, a quote from the Kafachayim, in two places, in Simon Reish Ein Aleph and Simon Ein, Ein, Ein Reish Beis, I think, where the Kavachayim says, according to Kabbalah, there's a certain sequence. There's a sequence of the Nishoma Yaseira coming, and it comes first at Kabbalah Shabbos, then it comes, uh, then it comes more at, at uh, Shmone and Borchu, and then whatever, and then it comes the more in in uh, at Kiddush. And if you're going to Kiddush before before uh, Mayriv. So then you, then you're mixing up the seder hashpa. You got the seder of the, you know, the, kabbal, the seder api kabbal. All right, that might be. They may they, they, that may be a valid point. What well, I did have a uh, a problem. So they say, according to this, perhaps he should daven ma'ariv early, rather than leaving ma'ariv for late. He should daven ma'ariv early. So he should do kiddush and then ma'ariv. Sorry, ma'ariv and then kiddush, which is the normal sequence. What my my our response to that is that davening ma'ariv early, the way it's presented in Shulchan Aruch and Alter Rebbe Simon Sadik Sifyut, says that davening ma'ariv early is only in order to be able to daven with a minion. Davening ma'ariv on early on your own is not so posh. Okay, there is you're know, referring to a Shal Simach Tzedek which talks about this, that uh, about davening. That's a different discussion. Should you daven be yechidus late, on, in other words, after nightfall, or daven with a tzibur early? Here, he doesn't have a tzibur in any case. So his question is, should I daven my early be yechidus, or should I, uh, and then I'll have the seder, I'll pick up all the correct, or should I daven my late, the seder, I'll pick up all the will not be, will not be per perfect. But he won't be davening by, in other words, the whole there's a whole business, the Ovid, the Ovid, Ovid, of it, there is a, a, a there is a leeway, there is leeway to daven Maidiv early from Plagamincha, but that's generally the advice is that's only in order to enable you to daven with a minion. All right, sometimes someone has got other has health issues, and therefore one would be made called to daven Bishasat Chak, but really davening Maidiv early is is a kind of it is a compromise, and therefore what I'm saying to this in Yaman is, whichever way you're going to turn, you're going to have to compromise. If you daven Maidiv early, it's a compromise. 
if you daven my relate is a compromise in the Kabbalah sequence. And as I say, you have uh, you have certainly have precedent to be davening Ma'ariv after Kiddush. Uh, it's not the ideal, but it may be the better of the two uh, options. Let's move on. Yeah, actually, you mentioned about the Tzemach Tzedek. This Ingeman sent me a copy of the Tzemach Tzedek, which is quoted in the uh, in the Sos HaShulchan of Chaim Noah quotes that Tzemach Tzedek. Let's move on. So here is the question. We have discussed this similarly about uh, at the beginning of the year, actually the Shabbos Bracious, possibly, about recharging an, a, uh, a hearing aid. So the woman who asked me uh, is part of a support group for children who have hearing problems and they wear hearing aids. Now there's something called co a cochlear implant and apparently the procedure for in, uh, uh, putting those in is that they they would actually the procedure will destroy any natural hearing and the the implant takes over but well, the implant only works with a battery and that battery works for about 16 hours so and, and basically what that means is when it's not working they are that hearing is totally lost they hear nothing at all so what can they do for shabbos Shabbos is usually more than 16 hours. So how do they, how can they manage to keep, to be able to hear for the rest of Shabbos? It's, we should offer an honest, you know, also not really, uh, it's the same problem. So they, so they ask, what about if they have a, a charger, which is on a time switch? Does it help to put the, 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 uh, the appliance on the, a charger whilst it's off and then later it'll go on so there is a little bit of gain in that because at the time when you put it on there's, no, there's nothing happening some will say that it makes no difference because it's absolutely inevitable that it's going to go on absolutely in other words 99.9% in this part of the world Baruch Hashem, you very rarely have power cuts so it's almost inevitable that it's going to go on at a later stage so that doesn't is does that mitigate it? It's a little bit, but does mitigate it. But my my approach here is the following: the Alter Rebbe in Simon Shin of Ches has got a quite a revolutionary chiddush, and that is that you are allowed to do a melacha kilachayad for a choyle she'ein boy sakon. So this is the Alter Rebbe's chiddush. Others disagree, but the Kohen Alter Rebbe. So he writes here, if a person is nofale mishko, that's the left definition of a choyla she'en b'sakana, and is, is not functioning. So then you cannot do yourself a straight isud rabbonon. You are allowed to do an isud rabbonon in a unusual manner, kil achayad. Then the Elder Rebbe adds this, this point, which is very powerful. With it, if you're doing it kil achayad, you'd even be allowed to do a malocha gemura. And the source is about a goineach, a person who's got some kind of um, problem, and his, his healing is to, to suck milk directly from a goat. So he's allowed to, I, milking a goat is a malocha, but milking by, by sucking directly, that's not the normal way you milk goats. Not that we'd milk, that's how baby goats milk, milk with, with sucking, but we, we, we would normally milk into a bucket. So there you see that you have to do a malacha gemura in a in a, in a shinui, in an unusual way. So on that basis, you're allowed to, this is something which I rely on the whole time, to advise people that if there is a case of a choyle, and the needs of a choyle, you're allowed to do even a malacha de raisa in an unusual way. My feeling is that a person who's unable to hear at all is no less needy than a choyle kol gofay. There is a halacha that if you, if a person in Dover Kama, if you make someone blind, so you have to give them compensation. If you make them a loss of other limbs, if you make, make this person deaf, you have to compensate as if you totally ruin the person. A person can't hear 
then they can't, they're, 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 not, they're not men, they're not, you know, they're not able to function normally at all. And therefore, I see that as Chala Kol Gufay. It's interesting, in the conversation with this mother, she said, is there any leeway to say that a Chedesh is Potom in Amitzvah? So therefore, the child, when when they don't have, when the air hearing is not working, they they kind of switch off, become Potom in Amitzvah, they're allowed to do what they want. So I said that, that I'm finding difficult to accept. A person who is who is chronically deaf doesn't communicate. So then, unfortunately, doesn't communicate. Therefore, um, therefore they 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 don't have they don't relate to the world. Therefore, they exempt from mitzvahs. Uh, but this this boy, you know, for sixteen hours of the day, he's communicating normally. The fact is, hearing is switched off for for a minute or for ten minutes for an hour. That doesn't make him, you know, loss of contact with the world in the broader sense. So for the moment, yes, but I don't think that makes him part of a mitzvah. Yeah, that, that's my 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 uh, feeling about it. It's it's not like yeah, I, I think he, he's he still knows what's going on, etc. So well, therefore, I, I I took I'm taking this view that being totally deaf is a an illness. Uh, for this, you are allowed to do a malocha, even if it were derais. Certainly, I know uh, that if this electricity is derais or not, we can argue about this. Probably not. So then again, that helps us. But to put those those uh, those uh, hearing aids, implants, whatever that is, to put it into the charger, kilachayad, and then to take it out after recharging to put it back on on uh, in their ear, so. So just, just in other words, just they remove placing in the charger, removing from the charger, should it be done kalachaya, then they can put them into their ears or remove them from the ears just the normal way. That's that's the way I felt it would be um, a fair psak. Okay, let's move on. So now the story here is that there's a someone is I'm, I'm making up the story to just to cover the details. He's gone. He's gone off to France, and every year he goes. To, he goes to the same place uh, in the Alps, and uh, there's a local bakery. And the bakery makes just these French baguettes, which are just flour and water, and a bit of salt. And so the ingredients are okay. Now I must tell you, I said this word over Friday night, and Biosa Volanda told me that regular bread has regular commercial bread has. Close has could have a hundred different ingredients. He says the fact that you can see that commercial bread lasts longer than homemade bread. That's because they put in stuff. Um, perhaps we don't want to know what they put in, but so it, it's not so posh. So we're talking about this aspect of the halacha. Does the kashrus the kashrus has to be looked in more carefully? Meanwhile, what happened here is. He comes this year to the same village and there's a new owner and his name is, well, he's, he happens to be a Jewish boy. He's open, unfortunately, he's open to Shabbos also. So now I'll raise the question. Of course, I'm not going to buy the bread which he bakes on Shabbos. But someone raises the question, wait a minute, hang on a second. If bread is baked on Shabbos, it's forbidden. So then that makes the kalim forbidden. Therefore, even the bread which you buy on Sunday, may be baked on Sunday, is also is baked in the same uh, equipment which, which was baked, used for baking on Shabbos. Does that not make the whole, all the equipment awesome? Had it be a Goisha bakery, no problem, because he's allowed to be here because there was a violation of Shabbos. Does that make the kalim also? That's that was the question. So here we have the beginning of Simon Shin Yudches. And here it talks about the concept which is called an aloha maase shabbos, the things which are made on Shabbos. So it starts off one who cooks on Shabbos or any other malacha of the Lamas of the Malachas. If it was done, if he did so willfully, knowingly. He is not allowed to benefit from that ever. From what he, let's say he cooked something, he made a cake on Shabbos. He is not allowed to eat that cake ever. Not only is the cake, also, but also the baking tin. 
in which the cake was sitting, or he made a, he made a, a, a chon. So the chon pot, which he made on Shabbos, so that that pot is also osur. Because the pot has absorbed a taste of the shalom, which was cooked with the isur. Therefore, just like if you cook bishul akum, you cook chalav akum, so then it makes an isur on the kalim. So, so to here, the, the pot with which cooking was done on Shabbos, that pot is also also not only the food. But then it says further, But for other people, that same food is permitted. Never mind the pot. The food itself is permitted. So according to this, arguably, if I come Motze Shabbos to that bakery, and there's a Jew who baked bread on Shabbos, he's not allowed to use it. But I would be allowed to use that bread because for others it's more to be after after Shabbos. It's also a portion. We'll see some um, uh, how do you say pull back on that later. Now that is in Hilchas Shabbos. In Hilchas Yom Tov, the Alter Rebbe says if someone violated Yom Tov and he wanted to make some more soup for next week and made two pots of soup, two pots of chicken soup. And they only need one today. The other one was made for after Yom Tov. Well, that's a, bit, that's a violation of Yom Tov. So he says, mm-hmm. So then there's a penalty. Not only is he not allowed to eat it after Yom Tov, but even his family are not allowed to eat it. So there seems to be a contradiction where, sorry, I didn't bring the full thing in. In Hichas Shabbos, the Alter Rebbe says the family are allowed to partake of it. And in Hichas Yom Tov, he says, the family are not allowed to. In other words, for whom it was made. And here's a Kutosach, and he talks about this. So there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction. Possibly, possibly you could say that Hichas Shabbos, which is Murcham, or the Alter Rebbe was able to be made of, because if people are not going to take uh, advantage of it, in the Chazyomta, which is perceived as less Chomor, therefore there's a need to be more Machmer. Okay. But meanwhile, what we're seeing here is that, that in principle, you have the halocha, that the baked, bread baked by a, go, by a Yid on Shabbos is mutter after Shabbos for others. And certainly then, the Kalim should be mutter. So I saw in one of the contemporaries for him about a, a, a group of students and they share they share a flat and some of them are share, they, they all agree to keep kashras, but some of them are share Shabbos, some of them are not. So I saw I, I made a search somewhere on well, Google somewhere. And um, so the, one of this, the, the imposter was saying that there's a problem. For the Shem Shabbos students, because the Kalim have been used for used for cooking by the non Shem Shabbos students on Shabbos. But um, really, I don't see the problem because the uh, the Shem Shabbos student is Achelim, and for Achelim it's Muta, so the Kalim are Muta. Now, he, he, this is from Piskat Shuba. Some people are, are recommending to be Machmir. Because there are poskim or machmir, especially for the family. Okay, then there's another important point here about um, the ksav soifer. He says that which the Morgan Avraham in Shein Yudches says that it's permitted for those for those for whom it was made. That's only if it's just a one-off situation. He did it willfully. But okay, we don't expect him to do it again, etc. But says the Ksav Soifer, if you have a, a restaurant who is regularly cooking on Shabbos for others, and that's his parnosa, certainly there should be a penalty for other people not to be allowed to benefit from it. Even though that may not dis- discourage them from running their business on Shabbos. But we, we shouldn't be allowed to have benefit from that restaurant or that bakery after Shabbos. And therefore, it concludes that factories 
uh, which are open on Shabbos, or hotels, etc., which are working on Shabbos as as as, a, as a, on a weekday, when you wouldn't be allowed to buy their products, which were pr produced through Chil Shabbos. Okay, so whilst we've seen in Shulchan Aruch it says La Achelim it's muta, the Ksav Soifer is saying that for his customers no. If that's his regular thing, he, he, he bakes stuff on Shabbos, you would not be allowed to buy that bread after Shabbos. Having said that, let's take a look in the notes here in 84. However, as far as the Kalim goes, says Ksav Soifer himself, that you are allowed to, you don't have to cash them. You don't have to worry, if you're not worried, but we're not talking about whether there's a worry about Trefus, just talking about the Chil Shabbos. So even the Ksav Soifer, Who's been saying that a commercial establishment which is open on which is running on Shabbos, are you not allowed to buy from them? But he's still he also is um, allowing the kalim that the kalim are muta. And therefore, coming back to our question, we're not even talking about the product. We're talking about buying bread which is made on Sunday or Monday because of the kalim. So again, basically, la kalim it's muta. Then even if you take the chumrah because it's doing it for customers, etc. But the kalim is more dangerous. Let's move on. Mendel, you're pointing out that the Alter Rebbe in Shiyomta has that. He says that point in the Hakutas Achron, especially since there was a Mairim. It seems to be, even if it wasn't that aspect, it would also be Mach. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay. So now, Different question. Interesting. Someone sent me this question that they buy. This is a question, I think, from, from the United States. One of our listeners who listens to the recording. You can buy you can buy semi-baked bread. So you've got a commercial uh, a factory and they go to a freezer shop and you could take from the freezer to when you can a semi-baked bread and on the instructions it says pop it in the oven for so much time and then it's going to be very good smart. so if it's not past your straw does that are you does and now you use the semi-baked bread you pop it into your oven does that now become past your straw that's the question so here we have on the screen from simon kufyud base in your the dinner of pas akum it says the following if a goy baked bread without it being involved in poking and soaking the oven for the oven didn't even throw a piece of wood into the fire even if the the, the, uh, the bread has become a little bit crusty still if it goes now and pokes the fire so long as the bread the bread still needs the oven and is going to be improving as a result, by staying in the oven, so the intervention of the yid is going to make it into pass his throat. So, so again, it's so very clear, semi-baked bread, it's not, and, and it's got, still needs the benefit of the oven, then that would be pass his throat. Then we have the second part. Yes, Mishoim, even if the bread was taken out from the oven, and you pop it back, a yid pops it back, and it becomes better, it's fully edible, but it becomes better by putting it in the oven. That's also good enough to make it pass its role. Now, that's actually the question which the fellow asked was, sometimes it says um, it's semi-baked, and sometimes it's fully baked, but you will make it gishmaka by putting it in, in by hot, etc. Does heating it up, making it gishmaka also make it into pass its role? So the second opinion says even making gishmak is also enough to make pasis straw. Now, can we rely on that second opinion? So here in the Kafachaim, he quotes from the um, from the Chidor, that when we have the Shulchan Aruch said a plain halacha, which says only if the oven is going to make it better, as in it still is not totally finished. Then he says a yesh mishoyim, and even just making a gishmak gishmak. When the Shukhan says basically it's not okay, and then it says yesh mi sheoimer, that it is okay, one should be machmer, that it's not okay, even if there's a hefzid meruba involved. He gives that, he gives a reference, listen to Chassidzis, but at any rate, so, 
so I would not go for the second opinion. That is, that if the rolls are totally edible, just going to become bishmaka, to pop them in the oven, that would not be enough. But if it's semi-baked, and so it's not fully edible, and you now pop it in the oven, that would be called a bishal yisrael. Okay, now that thing should be very interesting. So I was in a conversation before you Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av, about um, is it is it that it says in Shulchan Aruch, there's a similar Shulchan Aruch, I think it's Topk of Sama, about Zeichel Churban. And it mentions there about a woman would miss out one of her items of jewelry. So that she has a complement of jewelry and she'll miss out one item, Zeichel Churban. So the woman who's corresponding with me was asking, is that the reason why a kala does not wear jewelry for a chuppah? I, I see, see these are totally separate things because they're talking about we're missing out one item. He's not wearing jewelry at all. But, so therefore, I, I was intrigued. I didn't find too much. But what we have on the screen here, like this I found from the Sefer Minah Yisrael Taira, and refers us to the Sefer Avoidas Yisrael, which is the Koshnit Samagid, who was a colleague of the Alter Rebbe. Brilliant, uh, brilliant safer. He was a brilliant person. So he had a reputation of being Bokhi in, in uh, 600 Sifri Kabbalah. Right, so now he talks here, this in Parshas, um, I think Parshas Achre. No, 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 no. It's in, it's in Parshas Hazinu, Vazesa Brocha, somewhere around there. And that's in the topic of Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur comes together with Pasha Zazino. So he says the following. The Kohen Godel wears eight gar garments. The Kohen Hedjit wears four garments. What are the four? The Ksoines, the uh, tunic. Michal Saim is the briefs. Mitznefes is a turban and avnit. The Kohen Godel wears another four. The Choshen is a breastplate. And the aphoid, which is the um, apron of sorts. Me'il, some kind of uh, cape. But sits on the head plate, which we discussed earlier. So he writes the following The Koyan Hedjit is not able to be Mamtik Dinim, he's not able to sweeten severity as much. And that's why he could only wear um, the white clothes, which are Chesed, relate to Chesed. The Koyan Godel was able to also wear. The, the other clothes, which also include gold. As, well, let's look at those four. The Choshen has got gold. The Aphid has got gold braided in. The Meil has got the bells, which are made of gold. And then the Tzitz is made of gold. So the, the other four are the big days are. So the Kohen Godel has the ability to also be Mamtik Dinim and to take gold, which could also be causing trouble, and make it into, uh, into Kedusha. Now, then he quotes the Shamshan of Astropol. The Shamshan of Astropol lived about 300, 350 years ago. He, he, what he writes is absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's, it's like a brilliant, there's a piece which is some Haggadahs for Erev Pesach. It's just phenomenal uh, in Gematria, but it's like amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed, Al Kiddush Hashem. Uh, they, in some pogrom, they, someone, so the, uh, some Russia stuck up a, a spear up him, uh, his body. Um, so Shamshim Ostropol writes, he quotes a medrash, that because of your sins, your mother was banished. Now that's a posuk. Now then, the medrash says, Shulcho imchem ishtoir amchatz. And what that means is the following. But after the Churban, Imchem stands for, well, let's look up here, stands for Avnet, Michnosayim, Ksoines, and Michnosayim. So Imchem is a remez for the four white garments of the coin, what the coin head it wears. And because of the Churban, that was, was banished. They, and those four correspond to the letters of Yudhi Vavke, which he doesn't explain. What's left is Amchatz, which stands for the Aphoid, Me'il, Choshen, and Sitz. And 
Noitarikoin, Shekeneged Oisis Adni. So somehow he, the, the Shamshan of Astropol connects these two sets, one corresponding to Shem Avaya and the other one, which is Mulchesed, and the other one corresponding to Shem Adni. And then the fact that the Kohen Godl, although he is able to wear Big Dezov, and it's even able to be Mamtik Dinim with the, with the Zohov too, but when he enters the Kodesh HaKadoshim, he doesn't wear that the, the, the Big Day Zohov, he wears Dafka, that's the whole business of the Mikvah five times, because he has to change into Big Day Lovon when he goes to the Kodesh Kadoshim. So why does the Kohen Godel, who is able to do a, a Birur even with the gold, why does he, when he goes to Kodesh Kadoshim, why does he have to take them off and he goes to the Big Day Lovon? So he says, because that's the moment of Yichud. From Shasa Yichud, even the Kala takes off her jewelry, as is customary at the Chupa to take off the Kishorim or the Big Day Kala, and as a preparation for Yichud. So he, he has a, like a more spiritual reason, um, I think. I don't want to speculate too much, but he, he's, he's saying that there is this mimic of a Kala not wearing the Big Day Zoho at the Chupa which is similar to the Kohen Godel who is going into the Kodesh HaKadoshim and that's such a moment of, of Yichud, you don't want to have the distraction of the Zohar. Of course you're going to ask what about her gold ring? Um, I don't know the answer. Okay, alright I predicted that. Okay um, right, so I, I guess because that is that is the vehicle which is creating the Yichud but a, a side, a side a gold would be a distraction from the thing. Okay so that's just, uh, I just found it very interesting well, how he explains this, this uh, meaning of the Chakala not wearing jewellery. I looked for it, I remember somewhere in, in the Rashima somewhere about the Chosen told not to wear cufflinks because there was a word in Yiddish, oh, and I remember now, Zapon, Zaponkis or something like Zaponsis, to take them off. Um, I, didn't, I didn't manage to find it today. So we have that meaning of the Chosen not wearing the gold, and I guess it's the same thing for the Kal. Okay. We had a discussion about not wearing, by, um, about not having meat during the nine days. So someone sent me another source, and because he says the following Minadin, you're not allowed to have a haircut during this, this week of the nine days. Therefore, there's to remind you. There's also this meaning of not having meat and, and wine, uh, which are creative simch. Even though an oval, a chmon al is allowed to have meat and wine. So it's somehow, somehow like, you know, as a, in order to remind people that this is a, a state of, 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 of mourning, not to have haircuts and not to wash clothes, therefore just as a reminder. That's what this Sefer Mata Yehuda um, lived about 300 years ago. Uh, so he, he's quoted as saying this. Okay, let's move on. So now I'm coming back also to the business of the taking the, the broken jar, the broken glass from a chuppah and making it into a an ornament, etc. Heard of we how do you say picture frames, the chasana, uh, You're making you're, you're mentioning about the meaning of the time of the just silver headgear. Um, you're talking about Irshel Zohov, and that was like a, a golden headplate made of, 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 of Yishalayim. Yeah. Okay, so here you have uh, someone sent me, one of our listeners, you know, listened to the recording, sent me an article. So, so this is, is about this broken glass business. Is it okay to make a, a piece of art from the broken glass? So the first quote is from Rav Nevenzal. Here's the, he, here's the Rav of the Iratika. Actually, once well, was in his house once. Uh, very, very nice person. And he took the view that it's not okay. I think it's not okay because this, this, the, the breaking of the glass should be something painful, not to be making a profit out of it. Uh, Rav Meir Sander, who I don't know, says he doesn't see a problem with it. Another rabbi says he doesn't see a problem with this. Rav, uh, some, uh, Rav Schlesinger um, says, he says he thinks it's okay. Uh, and Rav Duner from Nebrak also says it's okay. Then he goes further. Um, 
uh, they someone put this question to someone, uh, Rav Gamriel Rabinovitz, who writes many, many articles. Um, is it okay to take the pieces from the broken um, dish at the Tenoim or the broken glass and make from them a piece of artwork? And he says, it says in Poskim, the reason for breaking the cup at the chupa or breaking the, um, there, there are reasons given for it, but there's, there's, it doesn't say anywhere that it's also Bahanoa. But um, okay, then he brings from a sefer called Kesar Shemto. Now, this Kesar Shemto was actually, I think he lived in London. His name was Solomon Gaguin, and he writes uh, the Minhogim of Minhogi Hasfardim of London ve Amsterdam. In the Rebbe's Haggadah, he's mentioned several times. So, this Kesar Shemto writes that there was a Minigan at Stroll to bury or to uh, hide the broken pieces of glass, or they would, they would dispose of them totally. And he writes there, he heard from the elder people of Shulayim, there was a kind of belief that there are people who are uh, um, into witchcraft who could, who could um, manipulate the nerves of the chosen. They shouldn't be able to have contact with this color. And they would, by taking an item of, of the broken glass, they would be able to do this. And therefore, as soon as they broke the glass, they would take the pieces and bury them, that they shouldn't be accessible to these sorcerers. He says another minig of putting um, coins, golden coins, in the pockets or in the shoes of the chosna, which I, I, saw that, I saw this mentioned somewhere. I've never seen it done. At any rate, so that they shouldn't be subject to, to the uh, sorcerers. So you see that there was a, this minig of gathering the pieces and th throwing them away and they shouldn't be used for anything. So he says that nowadays, so he concludes, nowadays that people are not concerned, that's a stroll, we don't see the influence of this uh, sorcery, etc. Um, and therefore he says that not this, that isn't a, such a worry. He finishes off, he, he does conclude to avoid doing this. So you, I'm just seeing here a whole range of Rabonim back and forth, whether, and, and, and you know, what's interesting, I mentioned, I think last week, I think we should be looking more at this question, who is the ones who are into it, is more like, should we say, Mizrahi, that type of uh, community. And these are Rabbonin for, the, for those, some of these Rabbonin for, the, for the, that community. And they are also having reservations about it. Okay, so there's, you can see there's the spectrum there. Some say pro and uh, some say it's not a problem. Some say that it's not appropriate. Okay. Um, one last thing which i want to share with you and i want to just remind say something but that ever once said by fabrenian he was talking about a rashi and he said that i'm got he had a, he has a, a uh, he, he had a question on the rashi i although several years ago i discussed this rashi and i gave an explanation for this rashi so he says but i reserve the right like someone else can ask questions on what i've said I can also challenge what I've said. So I want to challenge what I've said about, um, about the Sholem Aleichem. So if it was a couple of weeks ago, we had this discussion about whether women at home should be saying Sholem Aleichem together with the menfolk when they come home from a show. So what you have in front of you is, I just came, came to my attention this week, this is from the Sidor Shalom. So just to fill you in, there's two editions of the Siddur Shalor, which, pre, which pre, preceded the Alter Rebbe, both printed in Amsterdam. The first one was printed in Ayin Tof Ayin Zayin. That's just over, just over 300 years ago. The second one was printed in Tof Kuf Base. There are very significant changes between one and the other. One of the changes is that in the first Siddur Shalom, I couldn't even find Shalom Aleichem, never mind the instructions. In the second Siddur Shalom, we have this instruction. Now, that, that point is very significant because you say the Siddur, Siddur Shalom with awe and respect, but when you see that it's not there in the first print, it's there in the second print, so you know this is not from the Shalom. This is from the printer who... All right, uh, generously added more information, which the Shalot didn't say. 
So, all right, so that we has here in the Sida Shalot, the second print. This is a tefillah which is recommended for every man and woman at home after coming out of shul. So this is printed in Tofkov Base in Amsterdam. Just uh, now we look lower down on the left. We have here from the Alter Rebbe Siddur, the one which is Tofkov Samach Base, Sachik Samach Gimel, some 60 odd years later, when the Alter Rebbe published his, his, publishes his Siddur, he definitely had this Shalosh Siddur. No question about this. And he had this Shalosh Siddur and he changes the wording and he says, So it's, it changes very much that the instructions in the earlier edition is when they come back. And, and you know what? In all fairness, why should only the men be able to say Shalom Aleichem to the Malachim? Why should the women not say Shalom Aleichem to the Malachim? No, 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 no. Why, why not? So that's what, that's what he, his, the Shida Shalom is saying. And yet, the Alter Rebbe took that out and he says, no, it's, it's got to do with the one who's been coming home from Shul, and he's been accompanied by the Malachim, and then he's greeting them and bidding them farewell because they're going on to their next job, whatever it may be. So it's got to do with the one who's been accompanied. So is there a source for women also to say, so there you are. Uh, I didn't I didn't realize this last time we spoke about it. There is a source for it. What is our minhik? Primarily, it would be the one who comes from Shul. Someone else wants to join in. Um, you know, that's, can't do any harm. Okay, um, right. So I think we've covered all the points and I want to wish, if both the husband and wife, I, I doubt that in, in Amsterdam or whatever, also they also had Kinderlach and they didn't, I don't think they, he, he's look at, he's asking whether the husband and wife go to show. It doesn't, doesn't read into the words. It says, it doesn't say, it doesn't say the word bevoy basic he says they should say it at home. It doesn't say after. So it doesn't, doesn't. You can you can pick a lot of um, holes in, in this sentence over here. Um, but the alternative is quite, quite clear at any rate. The one who comes home from shore, when he comes home from shore, says this. So, all right, I'll leave you that with you. I wish you a wonderful week and um, you should be, be in good health and enjoy your holidays if you whether you're here or you're going to Romania or whatever, maybe enjoy your holidays. Call to.